I'm, I'm a lifelong golf resident, and um, I you know, kind of took this bill a little personally uh, because of that. Um, I've lived here in the Tampa Bay area for about 30 years, a little longer. Uh, but I was born uh, and raised in southeast Louisiana. And there were a lot of things that I really liked about growing up there. You know, One of them was how much outdoor activity we did. My mother used to pack the whole block into this 1957 Pontiac. It, you could fit a lot of people in those cars uh, and take us all down to a, a dock where we'd go crabbing. We'd you know, spend the whole day crabbing and catch all these wonderful, mysterious sea creatures. And we did other things. We learned to, once we could venture away from the house by ourselves, we'd go, we learned how to catch crawfish or go freshwater fishing, saltwater fishing. Got more and more adventurous by the time we were driving uh, and had boats of our own. We were all over the place, distant, remote locations. A friend of mine even had a, a boat large enough to pull a trawl, and we would go recreational trawling. So that was a, that was a wonderful thing. We had a, a group of friends that all had horses, and we'd go on these long expeditions, miles and miles of levees, woods, and uh, not a care in the world. It was very quiet and peaceful and fun. Uh, that was all great. And the, the people there, you know, in Louisiana, they're famous. They act as if they have their own personal license for enjoying life. But it's, it's not just them, because the people who move there eventually adopt the same attitude, you know. And then uh, New Orleans is a very special place. I grew up very close to that. And I've always had this, uh, what, what people call a sense of place. And a sense of place is a complicated thing, but it's basically when you appreciate the uniqueness of a place. And, and of course, New Orleans has the music and food, interesting architecture, long, interesting history. But it was even more, I had more of a sense of place because... Uh, so many generations of my family had lived in, and worked there. So there were lots of things that I did I really enjoyed. It was a great place uh, to grow up. Uh, but there were some things I didn't like. You know, frankly, I, I really did not like the oil and gas industry and chemical industry. And that was kind of a surprising position to take, or a very different position to take, I should say, um, because of the, the social setting I was in. Friends, neighbors, family members were all engaged in the oil industry. Uh, it was left and right. You couldn't avoid it. And so uh, you know, we ha I had uh, my, my brother working at a refinery, and eventually I married into an oil family. My, my wife's uh, father, my father-in-law, was a manager at a very large uh, Gulf oil refinery. I had an uncle who was an oil rig inspector. It's everywhere there were people, my friends at school all became uh, petroleum engineers, petroleum land managers, things like that. <clears throat> and even I worked for the for the oil industry in high school. I got out early, and I'd, I'd work in an oil service business that, that brought mostly groceries to the oil rigs offshore. So it was uh, a pervasive thing, uh, but I, at the same time, I, I knew there was a lot of environmental damage, uh, a lot of health risks associated with this type of industry. And how, why wouldn't there be? With that massive amount of industry going on, there are going to be a accidents. And one day, my, my older brother came home from working at, at the refinery, and his teeth were black. He had been chipping chemicals out from the inside of a pipe to uh, some deposits. You know, to prepare for a storm that was coming. And his teeth weren't black with dirt. They were, they were kind of like black pearls. He was in high school. And his teeth, were, his whole mouth was black. And uh, fortunately, it was reversible. Um, but that's not a good sign, you know. And the, the marshes where we fished um, had been crisscrossed with these canals where they, they dug and piled the dirt just in a line along the side. It was a gold rush mentality. Everybody was in a hurry. They, they dug the canal, piled the spoil or the dirt on the side in a long row, disregarding the natural flow of the marsh. So one side had this levee on it, blocking the flow, stagnant marsh on the back side, and the other side was just uh, unprotected. And the, the oil service boats, crew boats, that used these canals had two speeds, stop and full speed. 
And so they would race up and down these, uh, these canals and you could, you could actually watch the erosion taking place. And Louisiana is in a bad state now because of all of the, the loss of its coastal wetlands. And that's a very complicated procedure. It's not obviously not due to any one thing. But this was, a, it really created a kind of a negative attitude for me. Um, my brother's teeth turning black didn't help. But there, there was also, you know, I lived within sight of a, a, a refinery. I could see the torch from my yard. And that refinery was next to a ferry landing. And the ferry landing um, was next to the remains of an old plantation. And it had two rows of oak trees. You've probably seen the pictures. A grand entrance way back when. And these trees were very old. And the closer they were to the refinery, the, the more uh, diseased and dead trees you saw. Uh, the, the, there were nothing but skeletons of trees right next to the refinery. So... You sit there at the, in your car waiting for the ferry to get there and look over and see a very clear relationship between the proximity of the tree to the refinery and how dead it was. Uh, but people didn't seem to care. There was a, a, lots of evidence. These spills were happening. They're still happening. Just a few years ago, that same refinery uh, caused a cloud of uh, sulfur di dioxide to be formed on the Mississippi River. And the ferry went through it and everybody on board got sick, the, the captain almost passed out. You know, that kind of thing isn't, doesn't make good press, especially for a place that has a lot of tourists. So I wondered why other people weren't more upset by these kinds of physical, visible damages. And I, I thought kind of in a fantasy sort of way that someday Louisiana was going to wake up and they would uh, recognize the value of their sustainable resources and things like tourism. So at the same time, uh, I was also getting exposed to Florida, the Florida coast. My father's family had been vacationing in the Florida Panhandle since the 1920s. That's a typical thing for South Florida family or South Louisiana families to do: is to vacation on, in the Florida Panhandle. Uh, my father's family actually was from North Florida. They settled in the 1800s and then moved to Louisiana around 1903. So I had a family history in both places. And I really got to, I was fascinated with the Florida beaches because I had, from an early age, probably due to all the crabbing and activities like that, I had uh, become fascinated with marine life. And there on the beaches, with Florida and the Panhandle, you had full strength seawater, you had oceanic animals washing up, and I'd never seen anything like that. I'd read about it in books. I read everything I could about the open ocean. I read Rachel Carson's books. I read Tor Heiderdahl's adventure books where he floated across the open ocean in balsa wood rafts. Uh, this was back in the 1950s. I read everything Jacques Cousteau wrote, and his, his books were very much adventure books. So here were these wonderful fantastic animals on the beach that I was seeing. And Florida became sort of a, a wonderland in my view. Uh, I just always uh, look forward to the summer vacations, white beaches, clear water. And then eventually I, I went to school here. In 1983, I showed up at uh, USF as a grad student. And I'm still there. Uh, they managed not to kick me out. So uh, I had this kind of duality with regard to the two locations. I saw Louisiana and Florida as very separate. And, um, you know, Florida does not have the petrochemical industry that Louisiana has, obviously. We don't have refineries all over the place. And this duality kind of maintained itself. I, I, I raised a family. I have some older teenagers now, and um, we've, we've been here, you know, as I said, more than 30 years. And Florida's starting to feel very much like home by now. Um, but I, I had one of, there was one event that was really profound in the way it affected me, uh, and that was Katrina. When Katrina hit, I realized how strong my affinity for Louisiana still was. And I can remember sitting at a restaurant on August 25th, 
the, the day before Katrina hit. And at that time, it was a Category 5 storm out in the Gulf. But we were sitting at a nice table in the sunshine, and it was hot, <laughs> as always. It was August. And uh, all I could think about was how wrong it was for us to be enjoying ourselves. I had a bunch of family members there, and I commented to my sister that all hell was about to break loose in Louisiana. Um, and of course, it, it did turn out bad, and, and I, I developed some sort of uh, survivor's guilt, you know, and sense of frustration. I really couldn't, wasn't in a position to do much about Katrina. And um, I did organize one relief effort, but really I couldn't leave my family and work and go help in the, in the relief process. So that uh, stuck with me a few years, and um, eventually, you know, I never thought that my history in Louisiana and my history in Florida would be related. And then finally, you know, when the, the uh, oil spill happened, nobody really knew the magnitude of it. There was just it was just a burning rig in the Gulf. We didn't realize it was going to be such a huge spill. But after just a few days of this rig burning in the Gulf. Um, I was talking with a friend and realized that we we needed to do something. We had the skill set. I knew what it was like to lead a research cruise. I knew how to use the instruments that we had on the vessel. I hoped it wasn't going to be like Kendra's experience. Uh, and so we, I talked with Bill Hogarth, who was the former director of the National Marine Fisheries Service and now our dean at the time. And uh, he told me to put together a couple of cruises in short order, just a few days, and we did. And actually went there, and you could see oil from horizon to horizon. It was a profound experience. But I felt uh, kind of good. There were a couple of good things that came out of this. One of them was that uh, I was able to be active uh, in, in responding to this. And the other was I was dealing with a problem that I had recognized as being a bad thing from back when I was in high school, you know, the oil industry, and I wanted to do something that um, could really help. So my students were wonderful in, in the hard work that they put into our problem. Our problem was, and this is a, a pretty simple one, if you find a fish that appears to be sick or dying or damaged in some way, how do you know that it was caused by the spill and not something else? So that was one issue. We have a, a student in the back, Jen Graneman, who spent years trying to do the forensic work to determine if a particular fish had been exposed to the oil spill. It's one thing to have one that's fresh and still has the, the signature of fresh oil in it. We were looking for long-term, lifetime patterns of oil exposure. And it took years, but she eventually uh, was able to determine which elements were uh, indicative of exposure. And the next task, an another student in the audience, Amy, who um, has spent a long time trying to figure out where and when fish was exposed. So yes, we can figure out if it was exposed. The second task was to find out where and when. If you find a diseased fish here on our coast, you wonder, was it exposed here or did it swim here? And so that's why the where and when uh, is, is so important. Um, so in the end, we were able to develop these new forensic methods over a period of many years that applied in Louisiana, they applied in Florida, but the best thing is they applied anywhere. You can use them in freshwater, you can use them in Asia, it doesn't matter. The methods we developed out of sort of a personal motivation at the start in, on my behalf uh, ended up being a more general and widespread uh, procedure, you know, one that could be used all over. So in the, in the small context of my own personal life, we ended up generating something that has a much broader uh, utility. <laughs>